Today we begin our sermon series on families and faith. Here we have the instruction for passing the faith on, both to ourselves and to others in our home. Read from Deuteronomy chapter 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your forehead and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Here ends the reading. As As your your children... children Listen with our, with our hearts, hearts and, and follow, follow you faithfully. faithfully. Amen. Amen. Let us bow in prayer. O oh God, out of all the words which are spoken this day, out of all the words which are sung, out of all the words which are heard, may it be your living word that remains and abides with us through the power of the Spirit, and in the name of the Christ we pray. Amen. On Christmas Day, my wife Kay and I flew out to Portland, Oregon, for a week of visiting our daughter Caitlin and her fiancé Dylan, and with our son Colin and his girlfriend Farah, who had flown in from Berlin to be with family, hers in the Bay Area and, and, and ours temporarily in the Portland area for Christmas. We had snow and ice the first few days in Portland, which is usually a, a much more mild climate, and then rain and more rain for a couple of days, which felt very Portlandish. And then we had sun and 50 degrees our last couple of days there. It was so wonderful. And we flew back last Sunday on New Year's Eve day to Minnesota where it was, what, 10 below? And that night we went out to be with friends for New Year's Eve. And when we got home about midnight, I pressed the garage door button and bang, it was like a gunshot. The garage door spring broke in the cold. And of course, it was on a holiday weekend that this happened that would last another whole day, New Year's Day. And of course, the cord that you're supposed to be able to easily pull and then easily lift the garage door or let it back down manually didn't work. So we had both cars stuck in the garage, not only for that day, not only for New Year's Day, but most of the day after. We finally got through to the garage door company on Tuesday morning and they told us that their schedule was full and they couldn't come until after hours that day. And if we wanted them to come, we'd have to pay time and a half. And the garage door technician was a little early, nice guy, got it fixed, no problem. And he must have seen some of our Christmas decorations that we had up because he wanted to talk about the season in which Jesus was born. That's all he wanted to talk about. That scholars believe it wasn't in the winter, that it was in the spring or summer. And then we got to talking about how that's not really the crucial point about Christmas. How the main point about Christmas is that Christ, the light of the world, came into the world, born as a vulnerable child, the Word become flesh and dwelling among us. And it just felt like everyday talk for me, but also for him. It was God talk. Today we start a three-part sermon series on families and faith together. And our topic today is God talk. Now, this isn't just for the traditional two-parent family with 1.6 children. No kid is just six-tenths of a person. 
I'm talking about the place where you receive your main emotional support for this part of your journey in life. Whether you're a single parent with kids, or maybe you're an empty nester, or maybe your main emotional support system is in your extended family, whether they live close or whether they live farther away, or maybe it's in the workplace, or maybe it's in your small group here at church. But how do you do God talk in whatever your family is, in whatever the main emotional support system for your life is? How do you do God talk? How do we talk about something so important to us as God, as Jesus, as the Divine Spirit, or as AA says, as our higher power? In ancient Israel, the Hebrew people were instructed to speak of God's teachings to their children at home and away, whether busy or at rest. They were to bind them on their wrists. They were to place them on their foreheads. They were to write them on the doorpost of their homes. And that's why today devout Jews will place mezuzahs. The, the box is called a mezuzah. They'll place this mezuzah next to their front door, and they will touch them as they enter their residence. Inside the mezuzah is Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5 from our scripture today. It's called the Shema, which means hear or listen. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. This can help make this key scripture to the Jewish faith, this can help make their faith an everyday, everyday, everyday part of their lives. How do we do God talk? With the persons who are in our families, with the persons who are in our emotional support systems, First of all, acknowledge emotions, whether in yourself or in a child or an adult. William Meal tells about a group of parents waiting to pick up their nursery school children from their last pre-Christmas class session. As the youngsters ran from their lockers, each one carried the surprise, the brightly wrapped package, which they had been working on diligently. They'd been working on this for weeks. One small boy trying to run, put on his coat, and tried to wave and do all these things all at the same time, and he slipped and fell. The surprise fell out of his grasp, landed on the floor, and broke with an obvious ceramic crash. The boy's first reaction was stunned silence. And then he sent up an inconsolable wail. The father, thinking to comfort him, knelt down and murmured, Now it doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter. But his mother, much wiser in such affairs, swept the boy into her arms and said, Oh, but it does matter. It matters a great deal. And she wept with her son. God made us as emotional beings with the whole range of emotions. When I do premarital counseling with couples, I will often ask each of them which emotion they have the most trouble expressing. Sadness, gladness, madness, actually sadness or fear or anger or joy or disappointment. So often... Not always, of course. I find that men have more trouble expressing their emotions. Ask yourself which emotions you have the most trouble expressing. And maybe the emotions that you have the most trouble acknowledging in your loved ones. You can work on this. This can be part of your New Year's journey. It can make you more present 
and able to talk about all of life, including God, with those closest to you. After all, we're talking about a God who dances over God's children, according to the Bible. We're talking about the God in Christ who wept over his friend Lazarus. Acknowledge your emotions. Second, let your God talk emerge from the day's events, whether they're large or small. My sister Lori is a mental health worker in the state of Maine in New England. And the other night, as a big winter storm was bearing down upon the East Coast, including New England, I texted Lori just to see how she was doing in the midst of the blizzard. And she texted back saying that she was fine, that our days growing up on the Minnesota farm together had prepared her well for any kind of snowstorm. And it's funny how you get to texting when you could maybe just call and talk. But I started texting her about the time when she was maybe four years old and I was, I was maybe 11 at the time then. And a snowstorm blocked all the roads leading to our farm. And she was sick. And I told her, this is all in text, I told her about our dad taking the John Deere tractor that did not have a cab back in those days. It, but it did have a front loader scoop. And he scooped his way about three miles all the way to the highway where he could hitch a ride into town to get to the pharmacy to get medicine for Lori. And Lori had never heard that story. And he, she was touched by it. And she texted back, It's amazing what our parents did for us. And I added one more text. I typed, You were loved. You are loved. Now my sister Lori is a practicing Buddhist. But talking about the undeniable fabric of the universe, talking about love in such a powerful and down-to-earth way, is a way she and I can talk about the bedrock reality of God together, whether we actually use churchy words or not. And all of that came out of simply checking in with her to see if she was okay in the New England snowstorm that was so much in the national news. Let your God talk emerge from whatever the events of the day are. Well, how do we talk about God in our families or with those people who, for all intents and purposes, really serve as our family at this point in our lives? Third, do not neglect the power of ritual. Now, sometimes ritual can get a bum rap as something dry and boring and unspiritual. And no doubt, rituals can be all that. But ritual is really a repeatable act that carries a deeper meaning. Next Sunday, there will be ritual. Next Sunday at that cathedral in downtown Minneapolis, the high priests called quarterbacks will lead many rituals called first down, second down, third down, and fourth down. And many of the people in the congregation, that is the people in the stands, will fervently pray that their high priests can lead them to the promised land, also known as the end zone, also known as touchdown. There will be rituals galore in all seriousness. When our children were little, their first experience was de with death was when Furball died. Furball was the family kitten. Furball was son of waffles. It was all very sad, and we decided to have a family burial service for Furball underneath one of our pine trees in our front yard. And that ritual included prayers and digging a hole. We checked, of course, to make sure it was safe. 
and solemnly placing Furball in the hall and then covering him up. It helped to carry our kids through the mystery called death. Remember to be creative in your rituals. Remember to be creative, which can help them stay away from being dry and lifeless. For instance, our sisters and brothers in the Reformed tradition of Christianity, in the Reformed Church of America, in the Christian Reformed Church, will often say grace after meals. After meals. Who says that grace can only happen before the meal? Stay creative in your rituals. We are inherently ritual-making people, creatures. And often, when you think about rituals, it is touch, it is physicality that makes a ritual meaningful. How wonderful it was on Christmas Day 13 days ago to arrive safely in Portland to drive through ice and snow through the, the hills of Portland, where drivers are not very accustomed to driving in such weather conditions, and to sit down at supper and hold hands and give thanks to God for all being together at the same time. Our son Colin and his girlfriend Farah from Berlin, our daughter Caitlin and her fiancé Dylan from Portland, and my wife Kay and me. Physicality, spirituality, and emotions all tied into one. Or to hold hands and pray with your small group after sharing what's really, really on your heart. Physicality, spirituality, and emotions all tied into one. Or to take that rite of passage when your teenager gets her license. Think about it. It really is a rite of passage into a whole new part of life. And to have a prayer together, celebrating this step, and also praying for the new driver, and praying for all those she is going to interact with out on the streets and highways and freeways. And physically, take a photo of your teenager, her new license, and the car that she's driving. Physicality, spirituality, emotions, all tied into one. Or take that piece of real bread and dip it into the real grape juice and taste its pungency, a physical sign holding the ineffable, Presence, love, grace of Jesus. My friends, to do God talk together, do not forget the power of ritual. Be it overly exciting at the moment or not, be it weekly or daily or just occasionally, ritual is a repeatable act that can carry a sacred meaning. Now, I don't want to finish this sermon on God talk without giving you a tool you can use. So on each pew along the center aisle, you can find a stack of bookmarks. Please take those and take one and pass it on to your neighbors. And make sure that every household in the pew has at least one bookmark. In most of the pews, there should be enough bookmarks for everyone to get one. But these bookmarks are called Faith Five. And these are five things that you can do each day or maybe each week with your family or with a friend who is close by or, or with a friend or family member who isn't close by, but you can check in with them by email or text or phone call. And the piece on there about reading a Bible verse or story, what I would suggest there is maybe starting, if you want to start with just one verse, Start with the 23rd Psalm or start with the Beatitudes from Matthew chapter 5. Just take one verse at a time. But if you want to start with a larger chunk of Scripture, take the Gospel of Mark and do ten verses, give or take. And read that and then follow what you find here. 
you'll find five steps, faith steps, that you can use within your family, within that group that, or with that person who's your main emotional support system. And you can do this every day or every week. Well, finally, my friends, we might say, okay, well and good, but what if I'm talking to my kid or grandkid about God and they ask me a question I can't answer? Relax. Relax. You can say, that's one of the wonderful things about the world that God has created. There are always mysteries to explore. Don't be afraid to explore mystery. Don't be afraid to talk about mystery, about God. Amen and amen.